Hey, welcome once again to the Journey Church, New York City. I'm Carrick, and I want to thank you for joining me today as we continue with our new teaching series. It's called, And It Was Good, God's Plan for Sex in a Broken World. And today, we're going to be talking a little bit about marriage. And even more specifically, we're going to be talking about God's plan for sex in marriage in a broken world. Now, if you're single, don't tune out. Because what I promise you is that many of the principles that biblical principles we're talking about today are applicable for your life, for right where you are right now. Plus, next week, we're going to be talking about God's plan for sex and dating and how following God's plan will put you in the best place to find that possible best person that, that God has for you. So listen, whether you're married or single, you made a great decision to be here today. And so if you haven't yet, go ahead and click that button beside the live stream player and download your message notes because I, I promise you, you're going to want to take some notes along the way today. Now, in this series, we're going all the way back to the beginning of the Bible to rediscover God's original plan for sex. Because the Bible says that God created sex and, and, and that it was good. But then somewhere along the way, we've taken it and we've distorted it so that instead of bringing happiness and joy into our lives, much of the time sex brings in confusion and hurt. And there's some of you listening to me right now, and you've experienced that. You've experienced the, the, the hurt and the pain, the confusion, the loneliness, the, the disillusionment that comes when we take sex and we misuse it. And, and while the world is saying everything is fine, the world says there's nothing to see here, just keep going down the path. We know that everything isn't fine. And so what is God's plan for sex? Well, we introduced this uh, last week, but I, I want to talk about it again today. The Bible says that God's plan for sex is for it to be enjoyed between one man and one woman within the context of a lifelong committed marriage. That's the plan that we see from the very beginning to the end of the Bible, that God designed sex to be between one man and one woman within the context of a lifelong committed marriage. But we also know that the, the world's way and God's plan aren't the same. They're, they're different. In fact, in our uh, first verse today, it's our memory verse uh, for today uh, as well. It lays out two very different paths for sex and marriage and, and the consequences uh, for each one, the stakes that are involved for each one. And so I want to begin today by reading this first verse, our memory verse, Hebrews 13, 4, out loud together. So wherever you're joining us for church online, I want you to read this with me. Are you ready? Go. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Now, I want to, I want to take a look at this verse and, and what uh, the, the author of Hebrews is, is saying here. Because here we see a very clear distinction between God's way and the world's way when it comes to sex and marriage. Because the first thing we see, in fact, going back up to the, the second word, I want you to underline the word honor. Underline the word honor. God says marriage is something to honor. It's like a, a priceless treasure. It's special. Yet in our world, marriage is often devalued and seen as disposable. Instead of honor, this next word takes its place. Going back up into our verse, on the last line, I want you to underline that word immoral. Immorality takes its place. Now, the word immoral used in this verse refers to uh, an unmarried person having sex before marriage. Now, I realize that that's really common in our society, even among Christians, to have sex before you're married or even to move in with the person uh, that you're dating, your boyfriend or girlfriend, is, is maybe even a step to take before marriage. But I also want you to know that even secular studies are showing today that couples who live together before getting married are far more likely to delay getting married. And if they ever do get married, they're at a significantly higher rate of, of getting divorced. And so the world's way doesn't work as well as God's way does. It tends to confuse things. Now, going back to our verse, I had you underlined the word honor. Now, on that first line, I want you to circle the word faithful. Faithful. God designed for a husband and wife to remain faithful to one another sexually. So we honor marriage and we do that by being faithful to one another sexually. But the unfortunate trend for many married couples today is in, instead of fighting for their marriage, they're quick to throw in the towel when things get tough or to look for sexual fulfillment outside of their marriage. And that leads to another word I want you to circle. Again, in the last line, circle the word adultery. You see the contrast between being faithful 
and committing adultery, which, which adultery refers to someone who is unfaithful to their spouse. It's, it's when you have sex, you're married and you have sex outside of marriage. And adultery in our society, unfortunately, is on the rise as well. Because these next stats were really shocking to me. One out of five American men admit to having cheated on their wife. And even more shocking to me is that one out of every seven American women confess to cheating on their husbands. You see, the world's way of looking at sex and marriage says, if you're not happy, you're justified in doing whatever you have to do in order to be happy. Don't worry about the consequences to you or your family. Just do what you feel like doing. You deserve it. But let me just say this. Abandoning God's original design for sex and marriage hasn't made things better. It hasn't made us happier. Fewer people are married than ever before. And we're more dissatisfied, empty, and lonely, and angry than ever before. Something's broken. In contrast to how the world views marriage as a temporary contract that can be broken if you're not happy with it, I want you to look at how Jesus talks about marriage in Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. Look at what Jesus says. He says, But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Underline that phrase, the two are united into one. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Then Jesus says, Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And this is really interesting because in this passage, Jesus goes back to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, and he quotes uh, from the beginning of the Bible. And he begins by saying, a man and a woman, they leave their parents' house and they are joined together. And this is called marriage. But Jesus goes a step further. And again, I had you underline this part. He said, the two are united into one. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? The two are united into one. In other words, when you get married, the husband and wife become one flesh. You're no longer two separate people with two separate lives, two, two separate dreams and goals. Instead, sex becomes part of the process that bonds a husband and wife physically, spiritually, and even emotionally within marriage into one, to become one. And so God created sex to be an intimate expression of a loving commitment between one man and one woman who are making a forever commitment to one another within marriage. That's what sex does. That's its purpose, to make two into one in marriage. And so listen, when you commit to God's plan for sex in marriage and you experience God's blessing in that, you develop a deeper love for your spouse, you strengthen your marriage, you enjoy sex and you enjoy your marriage more fully as well. Listen, that's what God wants for you. And listen, as your pastor, that's what I want for you as well. To you experience all, for you to experience all the blessing that God wants you to have when it comes to sex and to marriage. And so let's jump in and look at this and talk about this. How do I experience God's blessing in my marriage? Open your notes to the inside. And like I said, whether you're single or married, these biblical principles, they're going to apply to your life. So let's jump in and look at the first step. How do you experience God's blessing in my marriage? Here's the first step. Commit to sexual purity. Would you write that in? Commit to sexual purity, both mentally and physically. Both mentally and physically. You know, three out of every five divorces that happen in our country involve some kind of infidelity. And even in marriages where cheating, not, not, you know, being unfaithful doesn't lead to divorce, Trust is broken, and it, it's so hard to regain the closeness and regain the intimacy that you once had. And this is also true when pornography is present in the marriage as well. You know, according to the Center for Research on Marriage and Religion, pornography is called the quiet family killer. It, it not only leads to higher rates of infidelity within the marriage, but it also contributes to over half of all divorces. And so there are two important areas that I want to focus on here. When we talk about purity, I want to, it's important to have physical purity, but it's also important to have mental purity as well. And these two are closely connected um, because what you let into your mind, well, it typically determines what you do with your body. You know, what you let into your mind leads to your thoughts, and your thoughts lead to your actions. Jesus explains this connection in Matthew 6, uh, verses 22 and 23. Look at what he says. He says, your eye, this is fascinating to me. Jesus says, your eye is like the lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, 
your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Have you ever heard that phrase that the eyes are the windows to the soul? That's what Jesus is, is getting at here. That's because what you focus on, what you look at, shapes your thoughts. And your thoughts lead to your actions. And so let me ask you this question just very bluntly. What are you letting into your soul? Light or darkness? Which do you think, and let me ask you this, which do you think pornography is? Light or darkness? The world says, listen, what's, what's the big deal with pornography? Who's it, who's it hurting? It's not hurting anybody. But we now know through every new study that, that's coming out that, that watching porn direct, uh, dramatically increases the likelihood that you're going to lose sexual interest in your spouse. It, it increases the likelihood that you're going to cheat on them and, and eventually get a divorce. You see, those mental images, they may seem harmless at first, but they lead to failure in the bedroom because a sexual encounter with your spouse can never live up to those mental images that you allow into your mind. And it's so addictive once you start looking at it. By the way, the widespread use of porn is also connected to fewer people dating, getting married later in life, and fewer people overall having sex. Now, that's the world's plan for sex. But I want you to look at what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12 uh, in verse 2. He says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Underline that phrase. I'm going to come back to it. Paul begins by saying, don't copy the behavior. The world's way is not working. So he says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you what? Think, circle that word think. If I want to think right, it, it matters what I look at and bring into my mind. Then he says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Listen, if you want to experience God's best for your marriage, for your dating life, for your sex life, then don't copy the ways of the world. Commit to sexual purity. Now, if you're married, here are a, a, a few ways that you can do this. I, I think are really important. First, create boundaries to protect your marriage. You know, Lori and I have certain rules uh, that, that we've lived with that have protected our marriage for close to 25 years. You know, one of those is neither, neither of us will be alone behind a closed door with someone of the opposite sex. You know, it's just a, a rule that we have, and it's just removed temptation. It, it doesn't give the, the beginning of something improper. It doesn't give the, the opportunity to have an emotional affair, have a, a connection with someone like that. It's helped protect our marriage. You know, another step you can take is to decide to share your passwords on all of your digital devices. I mean, give your spouse access to your phone or your computer whenever they, they want to have it. That builds trust, but also holds accountability and, and, and deepens commitment. You know, use filtering or accountability software on your electronic devices for the good of your marriage. And if you have kids, uh, for, for the good of their development as well. Now, understand no software that, that protects from pornography and, and things like that is, is perfect. But do your best to safeguard your marriage and your home. And by the way, when I say l let your, your, your spouse have access to your, your devices, that means your social media as well. So that there's no chance you've got secret conversations going on there. The point is, make a commitment today to purity in your marriage. Now, the second way to experience God's blessing in your marriage is this. Write this in. Cultivate intimacy in small ways daily. Cultivate intimacy in small ways daily. Now, intimacy, that's an interesting word because if you were to ask a man and a woman uh, what intimacy is and, and, and what it entails, you might get two very different answers. Because men are more visual and physical by nature, when you say intimacy, men often think of sexual intimacy. But a woman will often think about the emotional connection that brings intimacy. And so who's right there? Well, we both are. Intimacy can mean sex, but it also means the other small connections and considerations that can bring a couple closer together. And intimacy is so important. It's an important part of keeping the, the passion and the fire burning in your marriage. You know, the Bible talks a lot about keeping the spark going in your marriage, the sexual spark, the attraction. In fact, there's a whole book in the Bible. It's called The Song of Songs that focuses on the spiritual, on marital intimacy and enjoying your spouse. In fact, look at this next verse from Proverbs. It says, let the wife 
Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. You know, intimacy is the close connection a husband and wife share. And when it's missing, it, in a marriage, it, it can create boredom and lack of affection and even silence. And so how do you cultivate intimacy in a marriage so that that fire keeps burning, so the, the passion and the spark is still there? Well, here's my suggestion. Learn the things that make your spouse feel most loved and then show them that love in small ways every day. For example, you know, for my wife, Lori, physical touch communicates love to her. So a, a, hu- a warm hug at the right time, holding her hand uh, lovingly, those things are so important to her feeling valued and loved. Another thing that is valuable to her is uh, time, quality time together. And so when we have time together just to hang out or maybe it's watching a movie or talking or going out to dinner, that matters to her. You know, for me, uh, uh, one thing that's important are, is words of affirmation. They make me feel loved. So whenever she says to me verbally, I love you or I appreciate you, that makes me feel so close to her. Knowing what makes your spouse feel loved and then taking time to show them love in that way, let me tell you, that's going to naturally draw you closer together. It's going to deepen your intimacy. It's going to keep the passion alive. Other small ways to express intimacy You know, make sure every day before you go your separate ways to work or school or wherever you're going, take time uh, to give each other a hug and a kiss. Even if you don't feel very loving, make sure you do that. Uh, Listen closely to your spouse when they're when they're talking instead of, you know, nodding and saying, "Uh uh-huh, even though you're doom scrolling on TikTok or something like that. You know, don't give them your undivided attention. That makes them feel loved. And then for goodness sake, goodness sakes, stop fubbing your, your spouse. And you're like, fubbing? What is fubbing? Fubbing is actually a new word. And what it means is phone snubbing. Fubbing is phone snubbing. And this is when you're on your phone and you won't even look up to acknowledge the person who's talking to you. So stop fubbing your spouse and uh, give them your undivided attention. And then finally, look out for their needs. Find ways to serve your spouse and and do something that would really benefit them. You know, you could, you know, I I know my wife feels loved when I wash the dishes or when I help in in some other ways. Find ways to serve them. It's often the small things that bring the most intimacy to a marriage. And one thing that Lori and I have found that has really uh, cemented our relationship together, this this next one has has done that more than almost anything else, and it's, it's this. Cling to God and one another during seasons of difficulty. Cling to God and to one another during those seasons of difficulty. You know, when uh, Lori and I got engaged, uh, my mom pulled us off to the side and, and she, she gave us her talk. And this is what she said. She said, Carrick, there are going to be some mornings that you wake up and you roll over and you look at Lori and you're going to think, why did I marry this woman? And Lori, there are going to be some mornings you wake up and you roll over and and you look at Carrick and you're going to think to yourself, I don't know why I'm married to this guy. Now, her joke was, just hope that doesn't happen on the same day. But her point was very real. She said, listen, marriage isn't easy. And there are going to be some days and even some seasons where you don't like each other very much, some seasons which are hard. But in marriage, you make a forever commitment and you don't give up and you make it through those difficult times. And then she told me, Carrick, if you ever uh, uh, do something stupid, you ever walk out on Lori, I'm going to find you and I'm going to drag you back. And I've never forgot her say that. And I'm her, I'm her son. Listen, there are going to be seasons in your marriage when money is tight. There are going to be seasons in your marriage when sickness will come. There are going to be seasons in your marriage when your children go down a path you don't want them to go down. There are going to be seasons in your marriage when you don't like each other very much. And there are going to be seasons in your marriage when tragedy strikes. But the strength of your marriage isn't developed when the times are easy. It's developed when times are tough. And because marriage is the process of two people becoming one, that means you don't give up when the, when the times get tough, when trouble comes. You see, that commitment you made before God and, and to each other, to hang on together, that's going to deepen your love and faith in God and one another more than anything else. Here's what that kind of love looks like. Next in your, your notes is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7. In fact, I want you to read this uh, out loud together, beginning with love. Are you ready? Go. 
Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. I love that. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. You know, there's a man in our church whose wife passed away after 58 years of marriage. I don't have to tell you, 58 years of marriage is very rare. And he shared uh, many of the good times that they had together. You know, the family time, the, the holidays, the memories. But he also shared about the tough days as well. The arguments, the stresses of raising a family and trying to start a business. But then the real hard days came when his wife got sick and required greater care. The five weeks in the hospital, in the ICU, where she was suffering following emergency surgery before she finally passed away. You know, in 1964, when they said, I do for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part, they kept that promise. He honored his wife. He honored their wedding vows. And he honored the Lord in his commitment to his wife. Listen, no marriage is perfect because no married couple is perfect. It takes work. And there'll be times when you say something that, that cuts deep and you wish you could take it back, but it's too late. There'll be times when you feel alone. There'll be times you feel misunderstood. There'll be seasons of loss when it, when it seems like nothing makes sense. But if you'll cling to God and you'll cling to each other during those storms, not only will you make it through those difficult times, but your love for God and your love for one another will grow deeper and it will grow stronger. And if you want to have the kind of marriage that survives the tough times, the kind of marriage that God blesses, this next step is key. Write this in. Communicate love and respect to my spouse wholeheartedly. Communicate love and respect to my spouse wholeheartedly. Let me just say this. Communication is key to a successful marriage. And, and if there's a breakdown in communication, I'll, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a breakdown in your marriage. But it's, it's not that simple because not all communication is created equal. Yelling is communication. Lying is communication. Arguing is communication. Even sulking is communication. So we have to communicate the right things in the right way if we want our marriage to, to thrive. In uh, Ephesians 5.33, uh, the Apostle Paul shows us uh, the, uh, the best way to communicate. Ephesians 5.33, look at what he says. He says, so again I say, each man must love his wife as he does himself, and the wife must respect her husband. If you're taking notes, I want you to circle the word love, and I want you to circle the word respect. Circle that, love and respect. See, healthy communication in a loving marriage is built on those two words, love and respect. Now, the world says uh, you got to win. And so the two words for the world are fight and win, fight and win. But God says, no, if you want a, a, a marriage that thrives where you're close, then it's love and respect. Husbands long to be respected by their wives. Wives long to be fully and deeply loved by their husbands. And it's when we feel both the love and respect from our spouse that it's easier to in turn love and and respect them. Words matter in marriage. In fact, I want you to think back. If you're married, I want you to think back to your wedding day. I want you to think back to the words that you communicated to your spouse on your wedding day. Can you, can you remember those? Most people can't. Uh, most people, the vows are the last thing on their minds on their wedding day, and, and they, they can't remember much about the ceremony. But those vows matter. Because you made those vows before God as a sign of your forever commitment to your spouse. And I believe that more marriages would be successful if we would only remember and recommit to those vows that we made on our wedding day. So married couples, if you're listening to me, here's my challenge to you today. This week, you know, is Valentine's Day. But more important than going out for dinner, more important than candy or flowers... Would you make time this week with your spouse to go back and remember your wedding day? Would you go back and remember the vows that you made to one another on that day? If you have them, maybe you have physical copies, pull them out and read them. But even if you don't, if you don't remember them exactly, that's okay. Just remember that forever commitment and talk about it and, and recommit to that forever commitment that you made on your wedding day. Recommit to each other forever. If you'll do that, 
If you recommit to your wedding vows and your forever commitment, I'm, I'm telling you, it's going to strengthen your marriage commitment no matter what stage of marriage you're at right now. So today we're talking about how to experience God's blessing in your marriage or in your future marriage. We said commit to uh, sexual purity, cultivate intimacy, cling to God and to one another during those tough times, communicate love and respect wholeheartedly. And then here's the final uh, step. Write this in your notes. Consecrate my marriage to God daily. Consecrate my marriage to God daily. Listen, here's the truth. God loves your marriage. He wants to bless your marriage. He wants it to thrive. Your marriage is so precious in God's eyes because God is the one who brought you together. And so don't let anything pull you apart. Listen, even if you're not doing all the things that, that we've been talking about today, don't beat yourself up. God is going to be with you. He's going to strengthen your marriage if you commit to him and if, if you commit to keeping Jesus at the center of your lives. And so every day, Consecrate your marriage to God. Commit your marriage to God. Every morning, commit to pray for your spouse and to pray for your marriage. Every Sunday, be in church together. You know, studies show that, they, that couples, Christian couples that attend church together are far less likely to face divorce, and they're much happier. And then after you fight, because we all have those difficult times, always come back together. Forgive one another when you mess up. And never give up, even in the hard times. And at the end of every day, thank God for your spouse and for your marriage. And if you'll continually keep Jesus at the center of your marriage, God is going to give you the power and the ability to do some of the things that we've talked about today. The power to love one another, even when it feels like your human love has run out. Look at our final verse. It's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Let's read this out loud together, beginning with whatever. Read it with me. Are you ready? Go. Whatever we do, it is because Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for everyone, we also believe that we have all died to the old life we used to live. I want you to underline that phrase. Christ's love controls us. Christ's love controls us. Controls us. Who does he say? Uh, whose love controls you? It should be Christ's love. The love of Jesus controls us. Not the love of somebody or something else. See, when Jesus is in me and Jesus is in my wife, Jesus isn't going to argue with Jesus. Jesus in me is not going to have a conflict with Jesus in you. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect at this. You're not. I, I'm not. You're going to argue. You're going to fight. You're going to say and do dumb things from time to time, and that's okay. But when you've got a husband and you've got a wife who are both trying to move forward with Jesus, who are putting Jesus at the center of their lives, it's going to bring you together as you reflect his love internally and to one another. Nothing will bring a marriage closer than when you both focus on Jesus. And let me tell you, that's why the greatest thing you can do for your marriage right now is put Jesus at the center of it. How do you do that? Well, first, you, if you've never done this before, you invite him to come into your life. You become a follower of Jesus. You pray, Jesus, come into my heart. You be the leader of my life and the leader of my marriage from this day forward. And then you say together as a couple, we want to consecrate our marriage to Jesus. We want to experience, God, your best blessing. So we commit our marriage to you. I want to lead you in a prayer right now to help you do just that. So wherever you're joining us for church online, if you would right now, bow your head, close your eyes. Let's go to God in prayer. I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for the married couples in our church. I pray for those who are uh, single right now as well in their journey. But right now, I want to pray for the, the marriages in our church. Now, I pray that you will bless each marriage, each husband, each wife. And today, God, we consecrate our marriages to you. Strengthen our marriages. May they be filled with joy and love. Help us to stay faithful to your plan in marriage. And for those of you who are not yet married, God, I, I pray that you will strengthen them to live by your plan for sex so that one day, if it's your, your will, that they will experience your fullest blessing. And listen, if you're here today and you've never said yes to the free gift of salvation that comes through Jesus, that's the most important decision you can make for yourself and for your marriage. And if you're ready to step across the line and get right with God, I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. Pray it silently in your heart as I pray it out loud. God, thank you for loving me and sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I, I know I've sinned. I'm not perfect. 
So Jesus, I invite you to come into my life and forgive me of my sins. I want to live for you from this day forward as a part of your church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.